Hi there, welcome to this 2021 January, the first practice clinic of the year. I'm Graham Fitch and I'm the co-founder of the Online Academy, um, the online resource for pianists and piano teachers. What we do is every month, subscribers write to me with problems they're having in their pieces and um, I like it to be practice related if possible rather than purely technique, although of course the two things are inseparable. So um, if it's the technical problem you've got or a practice related problem that you've got or question that you've got, please do um, go through the normal channels, the, the correct channels to get to me. So what I'm going to need is bar numbers. When you do get in touch with me, I need bar numbers, the, obviously the name of the piece, and uh, from there, and as specific a question as you can possibly come up with. How lovely to see people filing in here. Claire is, is watching. I'm not sure where you're watching from, Claire. If you let me know in the comments, Viv, uh, Charles and Sarah also watching. Nice to see you. Um, it's lovely to see some old, familiar, when I say old, I mean familiar faces here. So if you would, as you come through, just hit those various buttons. The, the, we like the love buttons. We, we don't mind the like buttons. We also like the, you know, those new ones, the care buttons, anything like that. Just don't, don't click the angry face, please. We'd rather not have those. Um, Gary's from Nottingham, Lo lovely to see you. And CK, nice to see you, of course, CK. And Prithvi, and it's actually very uh, appropriate because Prithvi, Prithvi has, has asked the very first question. So why don't I launch into this? We've got questions about Chopin, uh, Brahms, Liadov, Schumann and Kachaturian. So if I jump in with Prithvi's question, and um, hopefully I'll be able to address this for you, Prithvi. We've got here, Prithvi says, Chopin Nocturne in G minor, opus 37, number one. Questions, guidance on playing, and then she's given a few. Thank you for all those likes. That's great. <laughs> um, this is the G minor nocturne that Prithvi is talking about. Oh. And but she doesn't have any issues with the beginning. Uh, the first point is here: the central hymn-like melody in E flat, starting in bar forty-one. How to play smooth legato chords, andante sostenuto, emphasizing the upper line. There's several things to say about this. Um, of course, it looks simple. If you open the page on, on, on bar 41, it doesn't look like anything much is going on. But it, it's a chorale, um, a hymn, uh, as Prithvi has said. <laughs> So there's lots of things to say about that. First thing, I would notice Chopin's long phrase markings. Um, we would kind of want to play two bar phrases, wouldn't we? If we were left on our own devices. We'd want to separate from there and then the answering phrase. Oh, how many faces am I seeing? Thank you so much. Um, but Chopin didn't do that. Chopin wrote a long legato mark from the beginning of bar 41 all the way over to bar 44. So we're dealing here in long phrases. So when, instead of stopping at that point in, uh, in bar 42, keep it moving. I'll talk about the voicing in a minute. Do you see there, I connected that phrase up so that I've got two, one long phrase rather than two shorter phrases. I think that's the first thing to say. The second thing to say is uh, about balance and um, texture there. Now, I don't believe that this is all about the top voice because it's, as you say, a chorale or a hymn. Um, and, you know, at the beginning, we've had the singing voice 
and underneath voices, which Chopin has been very careful to stem separately. So when he wants a voice that leads, he'll usually give it a separate stem, and then following voices will be, be given their own stem. So then you can sort of say, right, top is going to be more important, these underneath notes are going to be shadows. However, we don't want, of course, to play each note equally. That would be very, um, very bad sound, because what happens on the piano, the lower the note, the greater the resonance. So if I'm playing a three note chord equally, in other words, tonally equally, the ear would gravitate toward the lower notes because they have the greater resonance. So what we want is a little bit of top, but I'm going for something homogenized as well, a bit more homogenized. So not this sound. See, that's all about the top. So um, we'll look at how we might do that in just a second. But before I do that, I want to look at fingering. Now, this is a very important subject. The, the, the idea here of a legato fingering on the piano teacher's course where I'm a, a principal tutor, the piano teacher's course UK. If you're thinking of training to be a piano teacher, there's no better course. The piano teacher's course UK, look it up online. Um, a team of, I think, five or six tutors and a very small number of tutees. But we have this expression chord legato, which means that if I'm wanting to get from this E flat major chord, which I have fingered four two, four two one, to my next chord, the A flat major chord, which we would finger five three one. What I've got there, I have to release my thumb because my thumb needs to replay the E flat. Do I have to lift the top two fingers like that, or may I connect? Connecting, in my view, is better because it gives you more control over the sound. Can you see my finger legatos there, my chord legatos? There is a caveat, which I'll get to in a second, but let me show you without the chord legatos and no pedal. Everything is separated there. Now let me show you with the chord legatos and no pedal still, because I want to show you how I'm making my connections now by hand. Now, provided my wrist stays free and I'm not key bedding at any of those moments, that, that, that is completely acceptable uh, from a technical point of view. It, it, if I'm pushing down into my keys or when I release the thumb and my other two fingers end up compensating by pushing in, that's no good at all. That can lead to injury. Um, so we, we do very lightly release the finger that can't connect. And I, I like to suggest doing this rhythmically. So let me show you that now. One, and, two, and. And on the and, and, oh sorry, what am I doing? I'm releasing those fingers that I can't join. And, and there it's two fingers, and there it's two fingers. So that's a very good way to feel beautifully connected in the hand, in the legato. Now, in terms of the voicing, I like to sometimes think of voicing in, in percentage terms. So how much of the percent of the sound is on the top versus underneath? Well, in, in a in the beginning of the piece, you'd, you'd want probably most of the sound on the top. When I'm trying to find, it, let me just go back to the very beginning. I'd want a very generous cantabile melody, which was projected and the left hand played rather lighter. But in this instance, I would want to feel my blend. So what I might very well do is to practice the top voice with the alto one down and go for the blend there. What about the top voice with the thumb notes? Provided my top voice is ever so slightly stronger, I still want to be able to hear the, the richness of the harmony there. 
Prithvi then asks about the Unacorda pedal for the pianissimos in bars 66, 87 and the last bar. Yes, now, okay, this is a really good question. I find people are scared of the Unacorda, the left pedal or the shift pedal, depending on where you're coming from. All that the shift pedal does is it moves the action across to the, to the right if you're playing on a grand piano. If you're playing on an upright piano, what it does, if, if you imagine these are the hammers and these are the strings, so instead of the hammer having to travel that far, what it tends to, what the shift pedal tends to do is to bring the hammers closer to the string so they've got less far to travel, so they don't pick up the, the same acceleration there. Therefore, the sound is softer. Um, but the, the, the main thing about the, the shift pedal is that it changes the quality of the sound more than it changes the uh, quantity of the sound. So if you want a sound that does this, then lovely, use your unipat, unicorder pedal. The thing is, I can talk to you very loudly with my um, mute on, um, just as I can play firmly with my mute on, my left pedal on. If I want something that's soft around the edges, a sound that's not focused, but yet perhaps meta forte or stronger. Likewise, I can play really softly without the left pedal if I want something very, very clear. Notice here I'm talking to you extremely softly, but you'll hear every single um, syllable very clearly because I'm enunciating clearly. So it, it depends on what quality of sound you want rather than the dynamic. Now I have a feeling here that the left pedal would work beautifully that into a dream world, doesn't it? Especially as the next phrase is marked fortissimo. So absolutely appropriate to use it. Um, I, ha I have a, often remind people that every single piano in the world, bar none, is equipped with a unicorder, a shift pedal, a soft pedal. Um, it's clearly there to be used. If it weren't uh, used, or if pianists didn't want it anymore, surely manufacturers would stop making it. So yes, we do have to learn to play softly by hand, of course, but we mustn't, uh, by the same token, we mustn't be scared to use the left pedal when we want a particular color or sound. That would be my response to that. Prithvi also asks about a light touch on the chromatic passage at the end. Yes, there's a, a ferratura moment, I've gone too far, um, at the very end, in, actually in bar 86, isn't it, where Chopin writes the, the small notes. Now, people get very scared of those small notes, but this is, is not difficult if you figure out how many small notes we've got. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's just eight by eight. Um, so that could have been notated, and I would certainly put the, the left hand, the last chord, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, together with the A in the right hand. Pedal through the first uh, two beats, change pedal here, because those notes are absolutely fine to be absorbed by the pedal. Now I would be more careful with my pedal here. I might even decide to release my pedal and just play legato there. Very often fioritura like this are staccato under the fingers, leggero under the fingers. Um, sometimes they're more melodic. I would say this is, this is one of the more melodic ones. So very, very delicate, Prithvi there. Um, you can certainly practice with a non-legato. And a very light arm. So no bearing down in the arm, just the tip of the fingers very active, almost scratchy. So that would give you the sound there, but but I think you can you can explore something a little bit more legato in that instance. So Mamie has a question about the Brahms Intermezzo Opus 117 in E flat. Um, she says here, I found it tricky to play dark and quiet in the middle section with full expression and textures. Do you have any tips? Well, you, you've made a, a lot of 
observations there. Um, this, for those that might not immediately have placed what we're talking about, the, this is the beginning of the E flat. Wait. Wait. Move. Wait again. So again, Brahms's phrase marks at the beginning are important and to be observed. He's not written great long phrase marks, unlike Chopin. He's written short phrases. So I get a move on once I start my phrase. And there's a point of stasis. He stops. So it's not exactly a tea break, but there's a little moment there of repose. words that go with this piece that is a poem here by Johann Gottfried Herder um, and it's translated as sleep softly my child sleep softly and and lovely or beautifully um, uh, I feel sadness when you weep so the if the opening is all about the command to sleep softly and lovely and gently the central section the pure adagio at bar 21 uh, presumably has more to do with the weeping and the sadness part of that poem. Now, the, the texture, as Mamie pointed out, is, is interesting. Apparently, Brahms tried to orchestrate this, this piece, but he, he gave up because of this middle section. He couldn't find a way of orchestrating it. But I'm hearing two clarinets and perhaps a pair of flutes up there. alto register soprano alto soprano and then uh, he's got a little treat for us at the end he goes down even lower and then a phrase so heavy isn't it heavy and, and sad mesto should have put mesto there but he's put piadagio uh, sempre uh, pianissimo sempre ma molto espressivo so where does the expression come from here let me add another layer. Before I finish with that layer, I'm, I'm curious to, 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 as to this notation. He's given us here um, long, long, short, short and light. So the last note of each group, I would release upwards, up. Long, long, short. Not short, short, but lifted short. Against that, we find a staccato in the thumb. So what I would do first, very first, before we even do pedaling or any, because we will need to pedal through those staccatos, we're not going to play those staccatos literally, meaning sound and then an obvious silence. We're going to release the key, playing lightly in that thumb, lightly and somewhat sharply. See how that staccato contrasts with the legato line underneath, uh, oh, sorry, above. And that goes all the way through. And we will find that those staccatos will sound through the pedal. We'll, we will be able to hear uh, something through the pedal. And this, this is a very important consideration in piano playing, that touch shows up through the pedal. Um, as if by magic, it just does. I had somebody come for a lesson on it. And I'm sitting the other side of the room, therefore not seeing her keyboard. And I know she is, uh, she's pedaling correctly. She's pedaling each uh, change. This is Schubert. But she's playing staccato where Schubert wrote legato. She's doing this. my pedals down you can hear that that staccato touch as, as compared with the legato it's kind of 
mm. obvious, isn't it? So just because there's a staccato mark written, it does not preclude the use of the pedal. But I haven't quite finished with what I was going to say about the texture. In the left hand, we've got groups of semiquavers, that 16th note. Release. Do we release? I think it's worth hearing it with a release. One thing I am doing that will really affect your sound here, maybe, I'm giving a little bit more on the pinky, not just because it's my bass note, which is important, but because it's the first note of a group of four, and Brahms was very classical in his uh, ideas about slurs, strong to weak. So we play from strong to weak. Can you hear the, the length on my pinky? Now if I put that together, getting some of the darkness from that bass and the avoidance of an accent on the top of the, the left hand groups of semiquavers. So it's multi-layered. Now in terms of the pedaling, I've done quite a lot of thinking about this over the years and there was a time when I, I endorsed this pedaling. It's a bit pedantic. It's worth practicing. Did you notice what I did there? I, I lifted my pedal on that staccato. But the next group, the staccato comes in the middle of the group. So it, it, it's not really as neat as, as it may at first look. So you can pedal through half bars, um, grade the release of your left hand groups grade the the touches that you're using in the right hand so legato on the top staccato in the thumb it takes a lot of practice it's the sort of thing that you know if you were to walk past a concert pianist's uh, practice room listening to them practice this you would be amazed at how much time they would spend on all of these details to get the final result and they may not be happy you may look through the little window and see them sort of whipping their hair out can't get the sound i want so it, it we have to strive for the sound. Roger um, is, let me just read you what he says. Roger, I practice Liadov's prelude number uh, one from opus 11. My problem is that I get tense in my left hand when I practice for a while. I only practice this piece for a little while, then I have to practice something else. Will this get better with time? No, probably not. Or what should I do not to get so tense? Sincerely, Roger. It's a really good question, and I, funnily enough, didn't know this piece. And when I looked at it, I could see exactly uh, where Roger was coming from with this. Because the left hand looks like... Let me just play a little bit of it. like it's one position B minor that's then broken up two five one four two five one four um, well okay you could probably get away with that in the first couple of bars I wouldn't I certainly wouldn't um, because I'd want to move I'd want to move between one position to the next but if we look at let's take a, an example from slightly later in this um, maybe bar five Now, if you're, if you're able to see my, my hand clearly there, um, what I'm going to do, let me just do a little experiment. I'm going to land in the first sixth pair, which is G-sharp E. I'm going to land there and not think too much about positions or anything, just comfortably land. 
and I've noticed there that my thumb is actually not really on the so much on the keyboard. It's kind of on the keyboard, but it's not certainly not anywhere near the B that I'm going to need to move to. But if I would play the one three on the B G uh, B D, do you notice there that I've got a, a different position in my my at the angle, wrist to arm, and this is what's known as alignment. So I start off by aligning myself behind this pair of fingers and then through my wrist, through my supple wrist, my mobile wrist, I simply move to the next position. And my job is to glide comfortably between those two positions. Now at the beginning, as I say, it, it's not quite so obvious, but I would still not lock you see I'm going from that position where my thumb is not quite on the B to this position where my pinky is not quite on its B. So I've got pivot fingers there. Um, Pablo says hello from uh, the Ukraine, thanks for the stream. You're welcome Pablo. Um, you, but by all means put comments up there, I'm always happy to see comments. If I don't respond to them right now, sometimes when you're doing this live I, I'm, I'm sort of peering over here to see what it says. I'm using a little iPhone here <laughs> um, rather than any fancy gadget. So I'm just looking to my phone. Don't always see the comments as they come. Uh, what do you mean by key bedding? Uh, says Chia. Yeah, key bedding is an insidious habit where we press against the bottom of the key once we've arrived. So if I'm playing a, a loud chord, let me find a better loud chord. The because the, I want such a good strong sound, I need a fair amount of energy at the beginning of that. But the microsecond, the millisecond after I play that chord, I want to switch off um, the effort that was involved. So it's it's fortissimo followed by pianissimo within a nanosecond in my body. So my body is is. Is, is nothing there. There's no pressure down. So a bad mistake or a fault that pianists develop is this this tendency to key bed, which is when they get to the bottom of the key, they continue to push, which is actually something, if we go back to Prithvi's example earlier, if I'm lifting my thumb but holding on to four and two, there's a very real danger of when I lift my thumb, of pushing into four and two which is why the, the idea of a chord legato is frowned upon in certain circles. I'm sure it's because it, 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 it encourages, it. well, not encourages, um, there's a real possibility of tension that comes from that. But if you're aware of it, and then when you've released your thumb, just check in with your body, am I pushing into those keys? It shouldn't be a problem. Um, so, you know, there are pros and cons to every approach, aren't there? A shadow side, and a you know a light side so everything has a shadow side so the shadow side of chord legato uh, may be uh, tension if it's not dealt with but to come back to this example do you notice there Roger that I am moving So my first suggestion for practice would be, since this is a practice clinic, <laughs> would be to practice it non-legato, really lightly. You can legato your right hand. Then, after you have found a very light gliding um, arm, you could explore what is possible to join. Now it might not be, let me just find that example where I was in, in bar five. I'm finding that I'm wanting to join from the second finger on the top here to the third finger on the bottom of the next chord. Not that. I wonder if what you're trying to do is stretch stretch and join and hold on to the old position that would certainly explain your tension do you see there is a point of connection i'm holding on to my 
E, letting go of the G sharp, playing my sixth there, letting go of the B on the top, and pivoting round. Now, if you wanted an exercise for this, let me give you a quick exercise. I formulated this just this morning when I was looking at this question. How would I practice this myself? Well, if I were having those issues, I think I've covered the first two practice stages. This is useful. Let me just do it first and then I'll explain what I'm doing. The next bar. Uh, I think we got a little bit disconnected there. Um, I think we're still live. Right, so um, just let me go back over some of that again. What I'm doing is making a triplet let me do this. I'm being asked to share this video with somebody. I'm going to do that with Piano Garden. I'm now sharing this video with Piano Garden. Okay, um, so let me just go back to that because I think we had a little blip in the internet there. So can you imagine I've got triplets between those two notes? So that's the upper note of the first chord and the lower note of the second chord and I play first of all the G sharp on the bottom of that two notes for nothing then the upper note two notes for nothing which in the, encourages me to pivot back so that would be a useful exercise but what whatever we do we play very very lightly when we practice this left hand with great flexibility yeah Chia says I understand that thanks Graham great Sometimes it's very difficult to put these things into words. Um, Dominic, hello. Where a quick demonstration where you're standing there and I'm able to tweak it, it we'll often get the result quickly. But here we are online, so this is all we can do at the moment. Christoph is playing the Forest Scenes by Schumann, Waldsehen, and, and I have some trouble in the eighth piece, the hunting song between bars, 65 and 72. I cannot handle the right hand part without getting tense in my wrist. Do you have any suggestions to solve this? Um, yes. Well, I hope so. Uh, I was, again, this is not a piece that's in my, I play a lot of Schumann. In fact, I play a ton of Schumann, but I have not played um, Waltzane, and maybe that's something that I'll get to. I was going to say as I get older. Um, I'm already old. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll still get to it. So if we look at the, the section that, that Christoph is referring to, I'm going to do it a little slower just so we can all hear and just so I can, I can get a better result. Play from a little bit before. Now I think it's this bit he means. These parts. There's a lot going on in the right hand there. Let me just deconstruct it for you and show you what's going on very slowly. Release. There's a slur there and a release. So I would first of all um, really, really sense the releases. So release here because it's just a detached. Slur. Now how do I manage that slur? The fingering in this excellent edition, this is the Berenreiter edition, and the fingering is by, I always like to know who's, who's fingered uh, these scores, Ragnar Schirmer. I wonder if it's Schirmer, any relation to the publishing house Schirmer. But um, she has, I think it's either he or she, sorry, I'm not sure whether that's a male or a female name. But they put a three there on the G. I'm not sure I like that stretch between five and three. It's not difficult, but it's, it's I can feel it. So I would experiment with, instead of 4, 2, 1, 5, 3, 1, what would it feel like to just play 4, 2 again? So 4, 2, 1, lift the 2, 1, and connect. There's an example of a chord legato. I make the slur between 4 and 5, but not between 1 and, or the lower pair of fingers. And then when we come to bar 71, which is slightly different, annoyingly different. It's very similar, but it's just slightly different. Now, what would I do? I would make sure when I released my slur, my hand was loose and closed. And then I'd make a new impulse here, close, 
And I can do that fast. Let me show you that. So in those stops, when I release, I'm closing up my hand. Now you may say, well, you won't have time to close up your hand if you're playing that fast. There will be a little residue of loosening, closing there, not the full close. Um, but it's certainly my hand is not going to stay in a stretched out position. So I can feel it. I can feel it closing. Honestly, <laughs> you might not be able to see it here, but uh, so. So each tie up, puck, peed up, puck group, I approach as though it were a new impulse. That's uh, one thing. The other thing I would do here would be to deconstruct my right hand by taking the, the top voice by itself. And again, I'm going to do it slowly. So just the upper notes. And again, whoops, what, what is that? Five, four, five, five, four, five, five, four. Again, quite awkward. But I need to know that top line completely by itself, with no reference to what's going on underneath. And then I would further reconstruct by adding the underneath notes, but not the thumb. So I would do this. Now this is a new piece for me, but after a while that would, that would automate and I'd be able to do that stage that practice stage from memory um, looking down at my hands and I'm noticing here the movement again movement across I'm not trying to play in one hand position you know locking the wrist and doing this moving do you see how that works then I might try the thumb by itself or the lower line it's sometimes actually it's all thumbs uh, is it let me see nothing worse than practicing uh, live there's a the second finger there. So you take the, the lower, lowest note of that and then maybe add everything except the upper note. And then add perhaps the outer note without the middle note. So deconstruction in lines and then reconstruction. I hope that's giving you a few ideas. Don't practice it loudly, practice it very lightly, um, and, and do do lots of right hand practice by itself though, really lots. And just one final thing that you might want to experiment with, um, transposition. I'm a great believer in transposition. So using the same fingering that you find there, practice it in one or two different keys with, with that fingering. Um, that's a very powerful way of practicing. Uh, final question. Darren has written in to say he loves playing the Catraturian Toccata, uh, but he struggles with all the notes in the middle section from measure 109. OK, yes, it's very dense, this piece on the page. Even when I can manage to play it, OK, it still sounds like a mess. Oh, OK. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. The worst bit is from bar 115, which scares me half to death when I get to it. Can you give me any suggestions, please? Thank you. Um, I think I can. I'm going to go straight to the bit that you said is the worst, which is the two bars from, uh, uh, well, actually four bars from 115. Right, so what we've got here is the, the most important note probably in this, excuse me, this whole phrase is this D flat at the, in the bass. And I keep that in my pedal. Because that foundation bass, that D flat, is completely harmonic with everything that comes up afterwards. This, this is just a, a seventh chord, isn't it? Or ninth chord. But that's its bass. So if we keep that the pedal down, now very light here, this left hand is just padding. And do you see how I'm pivoting across there, Darren? I'm feeling that my third finger can act as a pivot. So I'm playing the upper three notes, 
pivoting across to my via my third finger to my pinky and again through the wrist so rather than jumping there's no jumping involved there so if you wanted to practice that fabulously hold on to the third finger and you don't need to practice with any pedal just go back and forth between the I'm holding on to three loosely of course no key bedding the way I think of this is you know those brad clips that you sometimes put in papers to, to keep the papers together they, they're kind of it's like a brass tack but it's got a spindle that you kind of splay out and then you can you put the thing through the papers splay out the spindle but it's very mobile you can keep moving the papers around similarly here I'm not key bedding when I do this whoops I keep playing an F natural F flat so the in the in the right hand we've got this lovely melody I'm going to play it with its bass those last few notes as kind of echoes There's, he's marked it rubato and then the melody goes here's where the harmony changes so what we've got there is let me play you the the left hand complete with just the right thumb and i would suggest practicing like this to this right hand is the the triplets that go on the top but if you first blocked these out I use a combination of two and three in the middle there I like a two here and a three there two on the G flat three on the B flat then I keep my three and then when I want to bring the melodic line out what I do is just very firm thumb. I almost feel like I'm squeezing with my thumb. You see again how I'm using my arm. I'm dropping my arm. You can't see. Oh, you can't see either. Dropping my arm down and then up, up, down, up, up. So if you wanted to just sense that in slow practice, down, up. Now, when I come up, notice that I'm not letting go of my keyboard. It's not this sort of an up, up here, but. So that when I put them together. I've got that lovely, um, exotic, romantic almost uh, sound. But again, I'm weeding out a lot of the notes because they're not important. I'm not. I'm playing them all, but I'm playing them very, very lightly. I think that goes for a lot of the earlier section. We've probably just got a minute to, to look at that. So the middle section from bar 109. Do you remember Star Trek, the old Star Trek, where Captain Kirk would fly to to some uh, you know planet somewhere miles off and fall in love with an alien? This feels to me like a, an alien love song, you know. I'm going for the grand line on the top um, 
Yes, I've just set a, uh, published a, a set of videos on this piece on the Online Academy. Ryan has just flagged that up, uh, or somebody. Yes, Ryan has. Um, so it's a very pertinent question. Um, the, the grand line. Sing it. Now wait here, watch here. You've got a long note, the sound of which decays. Match up. There's another one here. See, if I do this, and play the, the next uh, note with the same amount of tone as I used, I'm going to get an almighty crash. You know, so listen to what's left, match it up. Then you can, after you've matched it up, you can come back to the sound that you, you were uh, on. So what, what, what more to say, lots more to say about this. I've probably run out of time, but I would suggest in the underneath, playing very lightly. Forte, yeah. I'd want to go for that bass pinky there. So my E flat bass, I'm keeping that as long as possible. And I'm half pedaling, flutter pedaling. New pedal here. Change there. Change there. flutter pedaling for, for the for the scale I don't want anything too clean I don't want anything too sudden but I'm going for atmosphere do you, do you not feel that that's kind of outer space music a lot of this music is very um, it feels to me you know I can see the Starship Enterprise enter a from was it prize flying around uh, the megalocosmos there sort of glinting and sparkling it's a fabulously imaginative piece um, and I think I have finished yes this is the end of the questions that were sent in so I'm going to say goodbye and before I do that thank you all very much for your attention for your listening and above all for your questions and I'll look forward to seeing you in the next practice clinic in February bye bye